right, guys, uh, we're going to start. So welcome to another um, Astro McGill Public Astro Night uh, pu uh, Public Outreach Lecture. Um, today we have a very special joint lecture by a couple of uh, McGill professors. Um, but before uh, I introduce them, uh, we have a couple of uh, things um, to take care of. First, we're going to do our raffle. So if you came in here and uh, filled out a, uh, a questionnaire, um, you had a raffle ticket. So we're going to do the raffle. still a t-shirt? Oh, sorry, our prize is the mug. Uh, 490-2972. And we have a winner. Cool. If you come on down, we'll get you a mug. <laughs> All right, and um, a couple of other things. So, um, our public astro nights here, but we have our public lectures, which are a little more formal, uh, but we also run a, uh, Astro McGill, which is the outreach arm of the McGill Space Institute um, here at McGill. But we also run a, a, a wide array of research, uh, outreach programs. Um, one of our other things that we do is called the Toronto Astronomy on Tap, which are um, uh, outreach lectures for the public. They're much shorter and far less formal. Um, they're like about 20 minutes each. Um, they're a lot less formal and it's called Astronomy on Tap because these lectures um, are held at um, bars. Um, but we do those uh, once, a, once, every uh, once every month, but it's alternating English and French. Um, and the next one uh, is next week and it will be in, uh, in English and it will be, um, if you, you should check the Ask McGill Facebook page, but it will be next Tuesday, um, November 27th uh, at McLean Park. Um, and one other thing um, is, oh, I wanted to advertise our next month um, Astro McGill Outreach Lecture. So this uh, event for next month in December, uh, which is on December 13th, it's also a Thursday, um, that one, uh, that lecture will be a little bit special because it's a joint lecture between Astro McGill um, and Physics Matters, which is the outreach arm of the physics department of the OHA. Um, and it's going to be a uh, astrophysics slash physics talk on neutron star um, interiors. All right, and I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, so moving on to our speakers. Um, so we have uh, 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 two speakers today. Um, first, uh, we have Richard Livier. Uh, Richard uh, got his PhD, I'm reading from my notes here. R uh, Richard got his PhD at the University of Western Ontario, and he was a uh, planetary scientist at the Canadian Space Agency, um, Silver Saint Hubert. Um, and then he joined McGill as a research associate. Um, and more recently, um, he, uh, te he teaches at McGill as an adjunct professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, uh, Sciences um, and then also at John Abbott College. Um, Research-wise, uh, Richard was selected as uh, one of the 30 um, people to, uh, on the Mars, uh, NASA's Mars Science Laboratory Participant Scientists, um, and his research uses data from the uh, Mars Curiosity Rover. Um, and our second speaker is Lyle White. Uh, Lyle got his PhD at the University of Waterloo, um, and then he was a program officer at uh, the National Research Council of Canada's um, Biotechnology Research Institute, and he joined McGill's um, Department of Natural Resource Sciences as a professor, where he runs a large research lab at his McDonald uh, campus. Um, and uh, Lyle has a long list of accolades, including um, being named as a Canada Research Chair, Environmental bi uh, Microbiology, and he uh, won the uh, Fisher Award from the Canadian Society of Microbiologists for his outstanding research. Um, so take it away. Uh, And uh, thanks everyone for coming. It's a uh, little chilly evening. Um, latest uh, weather report from Gale Crater Mars is a high of two degrees. So yes, warmer than here in Montreal, but a low of minus 70, so don't get too excited. Uh, so uh, these are exciting times for planetary exploration and, and space science. Uh, we have uh, spacecraft all over, uh, not quite all over, but many places of our solar system. Uh, or many have been exploring uh, most of the planets uh, in recent years. And uh, certainly Mars has featured prominently in those missions. And uh, so this will be the theme for tonight. And uh, we are now at a scientific understanding 
and uh, we now have technological capabilities to actually go to Mars with robotic spacecraft and try and address this question of is there life on Mars. And so this will be the theme for our presentation uh, tonight. So I won the coin toss and I get to go first or something like that. Uh, so I was going to talk a little bit about the search for uh, life on Mars, you know, the history of that. This is not a new thing. And then I'll uh, show you some, uh, some of the findings from the um, Mars Science Laboratory mission featuring the Curiosity rover and talk a little bit about uh, Mars 2020, NASA's next rover mission, and uh, this idea of sample return. Okay, so uh, the idea of life on Mars is uh, totally, uh, totally permeates popular culture. And, uh, you know, from Marvin the Martian to Calvin and Hobbes, uh, David Bowie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, it's so common uh, in popular culture that many people, including students I teach, actually think that we found life on Mars. And I tell them, well, no, we haven't. Or at least the majority of scientists do not believe that we have yet. Although there's been a few sort of maybe, you know, meteor, Martian meteorites, uh, some weird things going on on Mars. But to date, so we'll get this straight, to date, there's no conclusive evidence uh, that there is life on Mars. Uh, you know, maybe a few people here and there who will debate that. But the scientific search for life on Mars also goes back quite some time, probably since the uh, earliest telescopes. And uh, you may know uh, uh, famous uh, Schiaparelli work, finding the Canali and uh, Percival Lowell and so on. This is a, another favorite early astronomer. This is a French astron astronomer, actually a, a jack of all trades scientist, uh, Théophile Moreux, who uh, made his observations of
composition, the alpha particle and x-ray spectrometer, which is the same as making the composition of the laser instrument. And then Coolidge instrument, the 10-pan instrument, which fires the laser. I've had this laser that's working for you. The 10-pan uses a technique called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. And this is what you see in the picture. And basically, it shines a laser like this that you can't actually see. And the laser interacts with the sample and creates a little spark. You see that little white spot? That's the spark. And if we measure the light of that spark, and then measure that with a spectrometer, or actually this is a thing called a spectrometer, which is a thing that you use to measure things. And we measure the light from the ultraviolet, infraviolet, and the visible and ultraviolet. Every element has a characteristic peak, and there's several different peaks uh, based on its atomic nature. So these are like fingerprints for what elements are present in the material. And so we can measure the composition of rocks and soils in very detailed, um, uh, with very uh, uh, detailed spatial sensitivity for very fine spots. So these are some interesting features. These are what's called raised ridges. They are uh, former uh, fractures in rocks that are filled by the mineral field, and they now break up in the air. And you can target these with two to five millimeter scales, which is what you see here. And you can target these on a sub-millimeter scale. So we fire the laser at lead tip one to two, different in several spots. And then we can fire multiple laser shots. And this laser shot is being driven from down here a little bit, so it's two microns. But we can actually start digging down and see what's going on here. And effectively, what you have is a very fine scale 3D elemental analysis. Okay, so here's where Curiosity landed at Yale Crater, and um, okay, so Curiosity landed in this uh, uh, landing glitch here. So this is Yale Crater. This is Mount Sharp, a large 400 kilometer high mountain in the middle of the crater. This is really enigmatic. We don't fully understand it. There's some really interesting things going on here in terms of how it's constructed. They think it's sedimentary rocks near the base. And uh, this is what is called the go to instrument. So we land here and then we go to the instrument above. And Curiosity has now traveled outside the landing glitch. So it's now still just a little bit over one uh, one kilometer, one kilometer. Uh, but I'll note that it landed 200 meters from the crater itself. So this is a pretty interesting landing glitch. Before uh, getting to Mount Sharp, uh, already we started finding some interesting uh, materials and rocks. So these are uh, what's called conglomerates here on Earth. These are like pebble-sized particles in these rocks. These are sedimentary rocks. These are grains that have been transported and deposited by water. And we know that the water must have destroyed water because it's quite big. So these ones are uh, like grains of one centimeter or more. So you see some of the energy that the water just transported to this. So this represents a rock that formed in a river. Elsewhere, Curiosity found sandstone, other sedimentary rocks, and smaller grain shocks, so maybe the water wasn't flowing as fast. Uh, and the way these are tilted, and the sedimentary structures in here called cross stratification, cross bedding, tells us about which way the water was flowing. So we can piece together these uh, stories about the past environment on rocks. And like I tell my students, every rock is like a book. We all need to learn how to read books. Uh, at a place called Yellowknife Bay, we came into a, a finer grain rock called a mudstone, and that's uh, a good, good rock to use the drill on. So here's the robotic arm of Curiosity. There's a drill at the end, and then we drill this, and it drills a little hole. You know, about the size of your finger, a few centimeters down. So we're trying to get down into the rock, not at the surface, which is completely bombarded by solar radiation and dust and so on. And you can see that the rock is actually gray. Uh, whereas everything on Mars is sort of red, that's because of fine dust that contains iron oxide. So it's basically rust that is being produced here in the iron that's blown over across the planet, and there's no more uh, dust going in, and, uh, and this dust gets blown around. So Mars, these rocks are not all red on Mars. And so the, the picture that we kind of have here is that we have, uh, in the crater rim, we had uh, rivers coming in, uh, depositing those conglomerates and those sandstones. We have uh, evidence for deltas, the ev rivers entering into uh, bodies of water, and we think these fine grain sediments are lake deposits. And so none of these materials are very obscure or different from what we find on Earth. And so we're able to interpret these and say that, yeah, there used to be a lake in Yale Crater, but we now think multiple lakes. So over the course of you know significant periods of time, due to climate change, there's probably periods of time when it's drier, there's more water, weather, uh, deeper lakes, et cetera, et cetera. 
maybe Mars looks something like this. When? Well, we estimate this, these rocks to be about three and a half billion years old. Roughly. Okay, it's hard to date these things. These are very ancient rocks. Okay, so this picture, of course, is not a picture, it's an artist's uh, rendition, uh, is what uh, this part of Mars would have looked like three and a half billion years ago. Okay, in the early history of uh, Mars. Okay, so we're looking for uh, habitable environments. So are there habitable environments in Gale Crater? Well, Curiosity has found rivers, or evidence of rivers, streams, and lakes uh, three and a half billion years ago. So there's abundant liquid water. Uh, it's found uh, rocks, sedimentary rocks, which indicate uh, uh, activity of water, and minerals in these rocks, which indicate that the water was probably quite fresh, not salty, uh, neutral uh, acidity, not, uh, not very acidic, not very alkaline. Uh, not very strongly oxidizing, so pretty much your standard lake water that you would expect to find, you know, like on Earth uh, or elsewhere. The presence of uh, compounds containing carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are the famous schnapps elements that are all required for life as we know it here on Earth. And that's the best we have to go by. So it's our only example of life. So we use that partially to look for evidence elsewhere. Uh, there's the presence of organic carbon compounds, which again could be uh, useful for life or indicative of life. And uh, in addition to sunlight, of course, this uh, environment would have contained abundant chemical energy sources in the form of minerals that contain different, um, um, uh, different uh, compounds or different uh, what we call redox states or some uh, 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 reduced iron, oxidized iron, reduced sulfur, oxidized sulfur, and to a microbiologist, that's a basically a buffet, all-you-can-eat uh, food uh, for at least some kinds of microbes, okay? So basically, we have everything that we would want to look for as microbiologists, and Lyle can confirm this later, uh, for what would sustain life. So this is an, an environment that could have sustained life, but there's no evidence here that points to life. So it's important to make that distinction. Now, uh, in the news this summer, you may have seen uh, stories related to organic compounds found on Mars. This was detected by the... Uh, a SAM instrument on Curiosity at a location called Pahrump Hills. Uh, it's not the first detection of organic molecules, but these ones were more diverse and a little bit more complex. So if you know your organic chemistry, black is carbon, white is hydrogen, yellow here is sulfur. We don't have to know or worry about these compounds, but there's a bunch of them. And it, uh, it's thought that the sulfur here may have enabled them to last quite long. So we think these are quite old, old like the rocks, and we think maybe the sulfur in these molecules has something to do with preserving them. So, what's the origin of these organic molecules? Well, they could be formed in high temperature uh, processes in igneous rocks or igneous uh, processes like, like in volcanoes. They could be from interplanetary dust particles, so from outside of Mars, or they could be from biology. Those are pretty much the possibilities. But I'll note that we have no way of telling right now if these are biological in origin. Okay? There's no, nothing we can say about them that says they're formed by biology. Uh, nevertheless, their preservation in these ancient rocks and their detection by robotic instruments uh, is promising for future missions. So we can go to Mars and look for similar compounds and, uh, and maybe find more and, and characterize them in more detail. Okay, so in summary, uh, Mars three and a half billion years ago, Mars today, so three and a half billion, uh, year, three and a half billion years ago, certainly habitable today, it's uh, certainly colder and drier place, and I put some question marks there, but Lyle will argue that there are some places today that could even support life. So we're gonna go back in uh, a couple of years with the Mars 2020 rover. Uh, this is the NASA mission. Uh, uh, Lyle will talk about the ExoMars mission in a bit. Uh, Mars 2020 will conduct rigorous in-situ science and look for uh, potential biosignatures, traces of life of some kind and uh, number two, it will collect and store samples for an eventual return to Earth. That's a big, uh, big difference, something we've never done before. Uh, I'll skip this and I'll just say that we're using a similar rover to Curiosity, so that's a way to save money. So Curiosity costs two and a half billion dollars. This one's only cost one and a half billion dollars because we're reusing basically the same technology with a different set of instruments. And um, I get to be uh, part of the SuperCam uh, science team. SuperCam is like ChemCam, only it's super. So it's better. Uh, up until last week, we could uh, we could talk about these three potential landing sites. But uh, NASA went and helped me out by uh, picking one. So this is where Mars is going to land in uh, Jezero Crater here. 
Uh, here's a, a curiosity for reference. Insight's going to land here on Monday, and uh, March 2020 uh, will land uh, over there at a place called Jezero Crater. This is what it looks like. So this is a little bit smaller crater than Yale Crater, but this used to be a lake. It's not a lake today, despite the colors. So this is an elevation map. And uh, we have these inflowing rivers, and we think an outflow river over here, uh, and this beautiful delta over here. And this is a, a delta is when a river enters a body of water. It's just spectacular. Um, so uh, we have these evidence of water, of course, and many rocks and minerals in this area that could favor the preservation of microbial life or traces of microbial life. So things like clay minerals, which are good for harboring organic compounds, carbonates, which are often uh, uh, involved in fossilization of uh, uh, life forms on Earth. So uh, there's pretty much where um, it will land. This is the landing ellipse. So it will be right in the thick of this beautiful delta here. So it's not so much a go-to place, but all the good science will be in the landing site. Now there is some stuff elsewhere that maybe the rover will get to eventually, but I'll skip that for now. And one of the things that it'll do is drill into rocks, like these fine, finely laminated, which, which would uh, represent lake deposits here, and collect samples, put those in a sealed tube, and then put that tube into a container, uh, as you can see here, all done robotically. Uh, it will uh, preserve these samples, uh, or, or uh, collect them, and put them in this container. And the idea is that someday, someone will come and pick that container up and bring it back to Earth. Now, um, why would we want to do something like that? So this idea of Mars sample return goes back several decades, uh, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, why would we want to do it? Because there's so many more and more powerful laboratory uh, and instruments on Earth. So just in this building, we have more analytical capabilities than anything we've ever sent onto another planet. Uh, future instruments will only get better. So return samples are the gift that keeps on giving. So you think about this during Black Friday. Uh, you'll never find a gift that's so good. And um, um, and just think of the Apollo sample that were collected you know, back uh, uh, starting in 1969. Scientists are still studying those samples. Okay? They're still asking new questions and using new instruments to uh, study them. And uh, many people argue that signs of ancient microbial life may only be discovered by humans using a combination of instruments and techniques here on Earth. Here on Earth. And many people argue we, we, there's no robot with a couple of instruments that's going to be able to prove beyond doubt that there's life on Mars or was life on Mars. Now, Lyle will show you some interesting gizmos in a minute here. And uh, so maybe, uh, um, uh, maybe that point will be wrong. So the idea is you collect the samples. Uh, you send uh, another spacecraft with a, a small fetch rover. It goes, gets that, comes back. You have some kind of launch capability here. You launch those samples into orbit, and another vehicle grabs it and brings it back to Earth. Easy, right? Well, we'll see. Note that there's date unknown, date unknown, budget not assigned, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and I'll end here just with a beautiful oblique view of uh, the delta in uh, Jezero Crater here. So here's the delta, here's the crater rim with that river coming in. Uh, just a spectacular sight, and I look forward to uh, Mars 2020 landing uh, in a couple of years. Hello, hello, hello. Great. Bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, well, thank you, Richard, for a great introduction and a great uh, uh, review of MSL and the, the Mars 2020 mission. I'm, I'm going to have to say that I've been lecturing at McGill since 2003, but this may be the most intimidating presentation I've ever given because my family is here tonight, my four kids, and most importantly, my wife is here, so she is certainly going to be evaluating my performance. Um, so I'm going to talk about, whoa, what happened? <laughs> that wasn't good. <laughs> I, yeah, don't push that button. There we go. Okay, we're good. Yeah, technology is not my uh, forte. Uh, so I'm going to, why does it do that? Okay, just a second. Okay, there we go. The pointer, the pointer lab. Okay, so here we are. I'm going to talk about this, uh, uh, this, this mission is called ExoMars 2020, which is led by the European Space Agency and also involves the Russian Space Agency. 
So it is a lander that is going to take off uh, in 2020, July, August, right about the same time as, as uh, the NASA Mars 2020 mission. Um, and it'll land on Mars hopefully uh, in, in uh, March 2021, and it'll be driving around there for a couple of years, we hope. Um, so what are, are its objectives, so on and so forth? Well, in, it's indicated right here. I'm going to go through some of this other information that you see here. Uh, and it's basically looking for, as Mars 2020 sort of is, uh, past microbial life. And they kind of say that it's also looking for extent microbial life, but that's not really true. I think that's mostly for selling the mission. Um, and it's basically looking for biosignatures as well. That is the primary objective of that mission. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you about the process of how you select a landing site for these types of missions, and then a little bit about the actual science that the, the, the rover is going to do. Um, it has to be in terms of finding a suitable landing site, and Richard went through the, the, uh, a little bit of what happened with uh, Mars 2020, the NASA mission. So in this particular case, it has to be scientific compelling. There are science questions that are being asked, and they are the drivers of the mission. But at the same time, uh, the, the thing has to land. And uh, that's just as important. These things are very expensive. The, the ExoMars 2020 mission, I think, is something like three, three, uh, three billion dollars American, two billion uh, euros. Um, so it has to be, it has to land safely. And when it gets there, it has to be able to operate uh, successfully in that particular type of environment. Um, and so the idea then is this: we want to find a spot that is about between 4.5 and let's say 3.5 billion years ago on Mars because at that particular time, Mars was warm and wetter. And we say warm and wetter, but we're not really sure what that actually means. It's suffice to say that it was warmer than zero degrees and there was running water on the surface of Mars because we can see all these features that look like uh, uh, lakes and rivers and so on and so forth. Um, and then we're looking for deposits, uh, fine-grained sediments uh, that have been deposited there in a very wet environment in something that we call a low-energy environment, such as a lake or a basin or a pond, something like that, not so much a river, but a place where things can settle down into the sediments, essentially. And then hopefully the same place about 3.5 billion years ago was covered with a bunch of other stuff, ejectite from craters, uh, dust blown on top of it, so that it protects it from the UV radiation or the high solar radiation that hits the surface of Mars for about 3.5 billion years. And then very recently, about 100 million years ago, this stuff started to blow off and, and uh, expose these types of terrains. Um, so we're looking kind of for sediments that have been covered for about three billion years and then and very, very recently exhumed. Um, and why do we want to do that? Well, we want to find a place then that we can go into, um, into the subsurface and, the, and the, 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 most, the biggest difference between the NASA 2020 mission and the ExoMars 20 mission is that ExoMars has a drill and that drill can go about one to two meters below the surface of, uh, of, of, uh, of the planet because on the surface, the environment is just too harsh. There's too much radiation, it's too cold. Um, uh, the chemistry of the soils contains a lot of things called perchlorates that are basically chewing up all the organic material. So it's been very difficult to actually detect organic molecules on the surface of Mars. And when I say organic molecules, I'm talking about the stuff that we're made of. Uh, and that's what we're really looking for with these missions. So we want to go to a place like this. This graph is kind of weird and it's not very, uh, uh, um, uh, friendly to interpret, but what it's basically showing you is that the deeper you go down into the subsurface, and if you get below a meter, let's say, into the subsurface of Mars, the surviving fraction of amino acids is greatly enhanced. So if you can get a, at least a meter to two meters below the, the, the surface of Mars, you have a much greater chance of detecting some of these organic molecules that might be indicative of life. So that's sort of the idea. Okay. So uh, when we first started this site selection process, it started in around 2013. There was originally eight different teams that presented places to go to on Mars. You can see these two red lines here, and these sites had to be within these two red lines because this was constrained by the engineering of the lander itself. It has solar panels. Um, it is not as good in that particular way as uh, Mars 2020, which has a nuclear power source. So it needs to th the land between these two latitudes in some place where there's not very much dust, which indicates all the black stuff. And this other por por point that's very important is that the elevation. Uh, it cannot land in a very high elevation place because it's, it relies on the parachutes as it goes and tries to land. And the parachutes need enough time to fill up with the Martian air to basically slow it down uh, so that it can land successfully. So that's where the, that's where the constraints were in terms of the landing. Um, 
and basically we've gone through about three or four of these workshops and we've got it down to about two different places. Uh, one's called Mars Bellus and this is Oxyoplanum. This is where these are on the surface of Mars and they're actually not that very far apart, about 500 kilometers between the two. And the little yellow things you hear are the so-called ellipses and the, the ellipses here are about 20 kilometers in width and about 120 kilometers in length. And what it really means, this is where the spacecraft is going to land. And in reality, it's going to land. It has about a 60% chance of landing within the center of that ellipse. So that's sort of the idea. Of, so you get an idea of where it's going to go. Uh, and what happened then is I'll just walk you through quickly of the process that happened a couple of weeks ago in, in the United Kingdom, where we basically uh, looked at the merits of both of these particular landing sites and, and picked one. So um, what I'm going to show you now is where they are again. Uh, they are part of. Uh, or the geomorphologists will look at these pictures of these places that were 3.54 billion years ago. And one thing about Mars that we are lucky about is it's kind of been frozen in time. It's not like the Earth where we've had all kinds of geological events occur and so on and so forth. And there's been water flowing in life and it's always transforming the surface of the planet. Well, Mars, this is what Mars looked like about 4 billion years ago. And basically, that's what it kind of looks like now, except it doesn't have the little rivers anymore flowing through it, that they've all dried up and disappeared. So what I'm going to show you is the so-called catchment basements of uh, these two particular sites. And um, so the catchments, it's like a river system um, where water flows into these two sites and deposits this water around these particular sites. And as you can see here, that the Marth Bellis uh, uh, contributor area has a catchment area of about 12,000 kilometers, whereas the Oxyoplanum area is much, much greater. And there's another redeeming feature about Oxyoplanum uh, was that the actual uh, catchment basement where the, where the water was depositing was right within these ellipses. Whereas when we went to Marth Valley, I'm just going to go, well, you can see that a little bit better here. So the blue areas are the lowest elevation components of these sites of the oxygen planet ellipses and basically all this water from that catchment area is flowing in here and forming a, a giant lake in this particular area. Okay, so uh, in, in comparison, this is the Marth site. And the Marth site, the ellipses are right here. The catchment air basement is, air, well, the catchment area is in here and the water is flowing down and the Marth Valley uh, ellipses aren't actually in the basin itself. It's on the slope of the basin. So water is basically being transported through a number of mechanisms through the ellipse. Um, so these, these points were considered, and, uh, and then there was another thing that happened. Uh, so the engineers uh, gave their presentation at this meeting uh, at the end of the first day after the two uh, landing site selection groups had put their presentations forward. And both of the science teams gave very compelling uh, and strong uh, uh, presentations of why we should go to their particular spots. But then the engineering guys came up and there was a couple of problems with Marth, and this is the first one. So as you can see, I'm not going to walk you through all these different events because this is not my, uh, I'm a microbiologist, not a, a rocket scientist, essentially. <laughs> uh, but you can see this is a very complex maneuver, and this is the most dangerous part of landing on Mars. We call it the white knuckle time, where you know scientists and engineers have spent 15, 20 years of building this stuff, coming up with these experiments, so on and so forth, and then it really comes down to about eight minutes of whether you can land successfully on Mars or not. And, uh, and Richard w showed you the picture of everyone jumping up and down and screaming when uh, they did land successfully. And the ESA so far has tried twice and basically crashed and burned two times. So hopefully the third time we'll be lucky in 2021. Um, so the problem with Marth is this. Uh, again, this is a very complex slide, but um, basically what happens is because Marth is at a higher elevation, when it opens its parachutes, it has about 15 or 20 seconds less time to adjust the landing uh, cycle. And that 15 or 20 seconds is crucial in that it increases the danger that it's going to crash. In fact, it increases the danger by about 10% to that in, in, uh, with, uh, compared with oxyoplanum, which is indicated there. So at that particular time, they were in big trouble just because you know you, the thing costs two billion, two billion euros and you want it to land because if it doesn't land, you can't do any science, essentially. So uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, oxyoplanum was chosen uh, because of its strong science uh, um, uh, abil capability and also because of the safety in terms of Marth, which just wasn't as safe as uh, oxyoplanum. So, okay, searching for bo four billion year old biosignatures in, in very old rocks, a daunting task. So you have to have some microbes. 
four billion years ago. That's the, bir the first big if. So we're not sure if there were, were actually any microbes on Mars to begin with. Um, so let's say they were on the surface of Mars. Um, then they have to be preserved for about 3.54 billion years. And then this little guy shows up uh, in 2021, drives around, and it drills a hole into the subsurface. And it has to drill that hole in exactly the right spot. And that drill has to work. And maybe four billion years later, um, these guys are all gone, uh, but there's some chemical traces of them. And there might be more chemical traces a meter down or two meters down. And that's what we're trying to do is to get down a meter or two to see if we can pick up these molecules, these organic molecules, uh, four billion years later. Um, we have some hope for this in that, as Richard said, uh, the, the uh, MSL mission has successfully detected some organic molecules on the surface soils of Mars in a similar lake type of basin, essentially. So that's the good news. So if we look at this again, um, we need to basically find a place on Mars within those ellipses where we think there was a lot of microbes. And places like sediments on the bottom of lakes are very enriched environments that have, at least on Earth anyways, that have a lot of microbes compared to just the water column itself or other different types of environments you might find here. So they're, they're microbial hotspots. And then the next thing that has to happen, that they have to be preserved in the best clays and have the best preservation type of characteristics. And that's not my area of specialization um, in this, uh, so I don't really know much about that, but I can tell, talk a lot about this particular point here. And then the next thing that has to happen is that A, this thing has to land successfully, and then it has to successfully find a place and drill a hole robotically one to two meters down. And that is a very difficult thing to do with the robot. So if we, the, 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 the drill is being made by an Italian team and they're quite confident that's gonna work and then they're gonna drill 15 or 20 holes over the one or two years that they're on Mars. And people like me who have drilled in other places like the high Arctic of Canada and lost drills, drill bits and drill columns in that thing would, would be very happy if it drills one hole, one to two meters down and gets those samples back to uh, uh, the, the, equipment, the instrument suite on top. Um, so where do we drill? Where were those potential microbial ho uh, hotspots uh, been uh, 3.54 billion years ago? So basically what people like me do in, in, in collaboration with the, geo, uh, uh, the planetary scientists and the geomorphologists who are looking at the shapes on the surface of, the mar uh, of, the, of these ellipses is try to interpret what happened there 4 billion years ago. And where we're looking for things basically like de lakes, deltas, and playas, uh, iron-rich environments, cold springs, uh, wetlands, and things like that. Uh, in those ellipses. Um, and people like me can tell them, uh, for example, um, what these microbial hotspots might be. And I just really want you to look at these two columns right here. Uh, these are the types of habitats on Earth. And these numbers here indicate the amount of microbial cells that you would typically find in such a habitat. And you can see that some of these numbers are orders of magnitude greater or lesser uh, than other places. So these are the so-called microbial ha habitats. So, uh, and the other part about this is that one thing that made oxyoplanum so compelling is basically it contains delta fluvial sediments as well as, as well as lake sediments. And again, these lake sediments over time would have been enriched for uh, microbial communities if there were ever were any microbial communities there to begin with. Okay, um, so this is the oxyoplanum elli uh, the ellipses that are being proposed. The delta comes in here. This is the basin that's here. And you can see that, uh, you might be able to see this, but all the red coloration that you see in here is the, uh, the spectral signature of different types of clays that would preserve those organic molecules that if they ever existed four billion years ago. So that's the kind of information that we're looking for. And that machine should land somewhere in this particular area here if all goes well in 2021. Um, what is on ExoMars besides uh, a drill? Uh, it has um, the same more or less the same types of instrumentation that the Mars 2020 does with the exception of the, the LIBS that Richard talked about. And I'll just, I'm involved in this one here called the Kloopy, which is sort of a, a device. I'll show a, a picture of it very shortly. It's, um, it's a close-up Im imager that has about, what is it here, 20 micron resolution, which means it's not quite a microscope, but it's almost a microscope, okay? Uh, so it has very fine, it's like a magnifying glass that would you would put up to a rock and you'd be able to see the structures of those rocks and you might be able to see evidence of ancient microbial fossils as an example. Um, and the other one that's very interesting is this one here, it's called MoMA, which is the Mars Organic uh, uh, an Analyzer, Organic Matter Analyzer. 
and it's a beautiful instrument that will has the capability um, probably the best one that's ever been sent to Mars to detect organic molecules on Mars identify what they are and has this one of the other little feature that it can detect so-called chirality and what does that mean um, well quickly t show you what that means so this is an organic molecule that it's the same organic molecule but you can have a left hand version and a right hand version and on earth all biology has either the left hand well actually it has all the left hand version and none of the right hand version okay so biology selectively selects one of these versions at least on earth and if it's biology or non biologically formed for example you can find amino acids in meteorites and if you looked at the chirality of the amino acids in meteorites they would give you this sort of sample that looks like here where you have a mixture 50-50 mixture of both of these things so if we if this instrument can detect organic amino acids in the soils of Mars and there's enough of those amino acids present in that sample that it can determine the chirality and they get a uh, this is what the type of patterns that they'll be looking for essentially to tell you whether or not they were biologically formed or not okay so if they got this particular result we would say okay meteorites non-biological but if we got a, a, a one of those samples that gave that type of fingerprint essentially that would be very compelling evidence that something interesting has happened there and, and potentially that something was uh, microbial life four billion years ago um, I'm going to quickly talk about, uh, just end this off with a few th things, things, you know, is there, is there cold, salty water on the surface of Mars, or is there water on the surface of Mars in present day Mars? So it was cold and, you know, warm, warm, uh, uh, warm and wet four billion years ago, but we have now some evidence that there still is liquid water uh, that occasionally can get to the surface of Mars. These things here are called recor uh, reoccurring slope linea, and they flow down the surface of a crater. Uh, on a seasonal basis, basically when in the summertime when the crater warms up on those slopes, you start seeing these features. We don't quite understand them, but some of these uh, slopes have been uh, detect uh, have detected hydrated salts and water and uh, as part of the, the chemical makeup of those slopes. And again, we don't quite understand that in terms of how that can happen, but this is a little cartoon of po some of the possible ways that that could be. And I'll just show you this one here, which I think is the most exciting, but maybe the most unlikely that there is an aquifer beneath those uh, uh, where those slopes are coming from and in the summertime it thaws enough that they break through and the water flows down the side of the hill and they would carry potentially some of the microorganisms that might exist in that aquifer and our instrumentation would be able, would be, would be able to detect that. So if I move, move forward, um, here's another really exciting uh, announcement that happened in 2018. Um, there was a dis discovery near the south polar ice cap of Mars in the subsurface of a hypersaline subsurface lake that is about, I think it's about a kilometer beneath the surface. So they use uh, basically radar penetrating, uh, ground penetrating radar, and these are the lines where this, um, these radar tracks uh, went through, and they give you images like this, and you can see this little blue line here, which looks like it is a, a feature indicating a basically a liquid uh, hypersaline lake about 800 meters beneath the surface of Mars. So there are liquid environments on Mars, or at least we think there are. And that's also quite exciting because now I'm going to take you back to Earth. Uh, so here we are in beautiful, beautiful Montreal on a nice warm November 22nd day. Um, and if we go up to the high Arctic in Canada, the first place I'm going to take you is right here, which is Devon Island. You can see there's an ice cap there. And on Devon Island, that's the ice cap you can see there, it was also discovered uh, and reported this year, earlier this year in June or July, um, that there exist these little lines that you see here using the same type of technology of hypersaline sub-zero lakes about 800 meters beneath the ice cap of Devon Island. And we're very, very excited about that because we're going to be involved with the project over the next two or three years that is going to try to de uh, drill into those lakes and bring out samples to see if there's uh, microbial ecosystems that inhabit that system. And I can take you to this place, which is one of my favorite places, which is way up on in the high Arctic of Canada, near the McGill Arctic Research Station on Axel Heiberg Island, which is about uh, 800 kilometers south of the North Pole. Um, this is a spring. It's, uh, called, uh, it's called Lost Hammer Spring. Uh, this is not snow. This is all salt that is deposited from the flow of the water that comes out of it, uh, of this spring. And if we go into this little tufta structure where the actual spring is, uh, this is what it looks like here. And these are a couple of people that uh, originally worked in my lab and, and studied the microbiology of it. So the, the springs in here, this is all salt that you see here, and the sediments are in here. The water in this particular spring is 
always at minus five degrees and is about 26 percent salt which is about 10 times that of seawater it's an anaerobic system there is no oxygen but it contains an active microbial ecosystem and for the microbiology people in here this is all you know like heaven on earth so to speak but just an example it came it contains organisms that essentially eat methane and breathe sulfate in this minus five hypersaline muck okay uh, so that's kind of fun um, and we look for bugs that look like this this one's called planococcus halocryophilus uh, this organism was discovered on Ellesmere Island and it is a uh, what we call a it's it's a it's called halocryophilus because it's a halophile and cryo because it can grow at sub-zero temperatures and phyllis means to love so it loves sub-zero temperatures and really salty environments it can grow down to about minus 15 degrees c and it can metabolize down to about minus 25 degrees c uh, so that's very very uh, unique for microorganisms okay um, and there are features on Mars, and these will, you know, when we talk to our people that are looking at these, uh, what's inside these ellipses, this is an example of, uh, this is a uh, lost hammer spring that you see here, and this is another feature that's been viewed from orbit that looks like it could have been a spring, and that these are salt deposits around that spring. So that makes it a very interesting target for potentially looking for life. And I'll quickly finish off here to tell you about some other stuff that we're doing. Yeah. Um, so. Richard had, gave us a very nice introduction about the Viking mission, which is still the only actual mission that's gone to Mars that had life detection instrumentation on board. It was designed to detect life. Um, the GC mass specs that we've been sending on Mars Curiosity rover and that will go on the two 2020 missions can detect organic molecules. And if they detect the right organic molecules, that would be potentially a life detection, but that's a, 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 a difficult thing to do. Um, so what my lab is doing with, um, in collaboration with our colleagues from NASA Ames is trying to build something like this, which are what we call unambiguous life detection platforms using nanotechnology and microfluidics uh, type of, uh, of uh, developments over the last five or 10 years. So this thing here is a DNA sequencing device. And we're trying to incorporate this into a life detection platform such that, um, I'll just show you the next slide, uh, if I can get this to work. There we go. Um, basically, this is what it does. This is a DNA molecule or, a or an RNA molecule that, would it, that goes through a small pore in this device, and it goes through this, so the pore detects that it's a nucleic acid, and then it can sequence that nucleic acid if the nucleic acid is uh, in good enough shape, so to speak. Uh, and it's very small. And I have an example of it here, actually, just to show you. So. It's, it's um, that's a DNA sequencing device. It's called an, a nanopore mini. Uh, you can see that it's quite small, which is very important in the space uh, planetary science exploration because there's about, you know, every time a rocket goes up with uh, one of these landers on board, uh, they have about 100 different science groups that are trying to get their thing on top of the rocket. And you're competing with all those other different science groups to get your particular device. So one of the re very redeeming features about this, if we can get this to work, and, um, uh, is that it's very small, has very low mass, and very low uh, uh, energy requirements. So that could make it a, uh, uh, a very attractive feature. And the other thing that I want to say about this, if you detect a complex organic molecule like DNA or RNA in a Mars sample or uh, icy moon sample of, of like Europa and Enceladus, you've essentially detected life on another world. There's no other way that we've ever come up with that can make uh, complex molecules like DNA or RNA. You can't find these type of molecules, for example, in meteorites. So there's only two explanations if you had a positive hit on this, is that A, you detected life on the given world that you're trying to detect it, or you brought contamination with you on the spacecraft and we can control for that. And just finally, uh, we're, we're making another instrument which is called a microbial, microfluidic microbial activity microassay is a lot, you know, I think I actually made that name, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. So, <laughs> um, so what it is, so this is a, this is a biolog plate, it's a, it's a 96 well plate, and these little wells that you see here, it's not much bigger than a little, you know, a big iPhone sort of thing, and every one of these little wells contains um, a substrate, a growth substrate, and it also contains a little dye, so you inoculate this with some, uh, uh, basically a soil wash mixture, or let's say you get some ice from Mars and you melt it, and you put about 200 microliters in one of these wells, 
And if there's any microbes in that system that can use that substrate, they will change this dye from a colorless dye to basically a purple color. Okay. Uh, so there is a mission that's going to launch in 2019 on the new um, giant rocket that NASA is making that is going to go into what we call deeper space past the moon orbit. And they've built an instrument like this, except that their card, this is what it looks like actually, uh, it has the same type of chemistry, the same sort of thing where if there's activity, you get a color change and it's very easy to detect that color change. So they made this thing robotic, the hardware is made, it's flight ready, so on and so forth. Um, and But the only difference is they've inoculated these little wells with a yeast cell. And what they're doing as it goes into space, they're looking at the effects of radiation. So about every two months or so, they're going to, to squirt the liquid into these little wells that contain the growth substrate. If the yeast cells are still alive, they will be active and perform this type of reaction here where we'll turn the, the color substrate uh, uh, pink. So what we want to do is transform this into this system here, except that these wells will not be inoculated. We will take a sample from a soil wash from Mars or ice from Europa, squirt it in this sort of thing, and use their hardware and their technology uh, to, to detect a, an active microbial ecosystem. So I think that's all I really have to say, except this is the one that uh, we have. I have a number of students here as well, and one of the, those people is here in the audience. He's the guy that's actually doing this, that's uh, uh, David. So there we go. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you for, uh, uh, for being very atten attentive, and I'm sure Richard and I will be very happy to try to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.